Welcome to Feminism Today, everyone. I'm Sophia Johnson in New York. My guest this week is Sahasin, the multi-award winning duo Janita and Clayson Benali from the Diné Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona. As brother and sister, they grew up protesting the environmental degradation and inhumane acts of cultural genocide against their traditional way of life. As artists, they awaken our sense of civic engagement, bringing music and a message of hope to Native American youth. Janita and Clayson Benali, welcome to Feminism Today. Yat A. Hello, everybody. She'e Janita Benali Yanishya. My name is Janita Benali. She'e Eith Lechi'i Nishle. I am born to the Red Coat people. Ado Kanani Torichini Vashishchin. I am born for the Bitterwater people who originally come from the Eagle people, the Eagle clan. Ado Nakai Dina'a Dashanela. The wandering ones who came back are my paternal grandparents, Otto Polish Olegi Dashice, the ones that they call the Polish people, are my maternal grandparents. Zitlejin de Nasha Otto Kintlena e Shechawan Alto. I'm originally from Black Mesa, Arizona, but I also reside under the shadow of the beautiful holy San Francisco peaks in Flagstaff, Arizona. Akut Ego, Shee Dine Estan Nishle. In this way, I identify as a Dene woman. Yet, a Clayson Renai Dasha Jene leads the Sithagin Dent, a Yusina Sha, Ado, Kinthana Eshe, Hwan, Anani Torich, Ini Basha Shinshima, a Vilagana Ashkenazi, Nishle, Ado, Polish Eshe, Che, Ado, Nakai Dene, Dashanella, Torichini, Torichini Basha Shin. Thank you for that very beautiful, warm introduction. I'm so happy to have you both here with us this week. I read you grew up on Black Mesa in northern Arizona, a place at the center of land dispute between coal mining company and the Navajo and Hopi tribes. The land has really been in dispute since uh, um, the 1880s or so. Uh, Janita, this question is for you. How did this experience inform and shaped your childhood. As Danette and Hopi, we've always been neighbors. We've always helped each other. And so there was this fictitious war that was made um, and it you know, publicized, it even went to Congress to create legislation to divide, to put a fence to divide our peoples mm. and our land. And so we as traditionalists know that there was never, there was never a war between Diné, um, that we we uh, we grew up. I mean, even at our age, we grew up going to the protests with not only our matriarchs, not only our grandmothers, but also with the Hopi as well, who were speaking on behalf of their communities, saying there is no division between our peoples. It's the government. It's the uh, it's Peabody Coal Company that is creating all of this. They're, they're creating um, this, th this media war, uh, a war, I should say in quotation marks, because it didn't exist. That's so powerful and so insightful. Thank you for that. Um, you were the children of tr a traditional healer and you grew up protesting, as you've mentioned, uh, the coal mine. And you, you really couldn't be, uh, have ignored, if you wanted to, the oppression of uh, sort of living in, in, in the experience that you grew up in. Clayson, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how this experience informed the type of musician you have become. To be an indigenous youth, basically living as a refugee, displaced, you know, when I was born, my father, you know, they had put a fence through our region and bulldozed where my umbilical cord was. And, you know, we, we were on one side of the fence where all of the, the water, the grazing, ancestral grazing lands that we used to access and utilize we were completely displaced and cut off from that so as a youth you know growing up in a border town where I was faced racism and you know all kinds of harsh things always had my my hair long and you know was always told you know you have to go to the girls restroom or you know just like all the sort of type of things that you you know, just to try to exist in a society that didn't ex accept you was very mm -hmm. challenging. So for us, um, at a young age, punk rock 
and that style of music was something that was very real and honest. And mm. we, somebody gave us a mixtape mm. back in the day of analog tape. So somebody yeah. handed us a tape with, it had like the Ramones, you know, subhumans, wow. amazing Bad brains. artists yeah. that were very pure, true and authentic. And they talked about politics. They talked about things that we were relating to. We were in the midst of, you know, oppression of, you know, being blacked out from the media and not being able to, you know, go with our grandmother, Roberta Blacko, Catherine Smith, all of our elders, they would go to Washington, D.C., to the U.N., all over the world, wherever people would listen and try to, to speak and use their voice. And, you know, it was like almost like nobody was listening. So, you know, it was hard, you know, to, to hear your elders cry and, you know, people dying from depression, from being separated from their homeland, being relocated or displaced. You know, yeah. It's really emotional. So it sounds like the music um, um, was a way to sort of reflect back to the community, certainly, but really to society, what you were really experiencing. Um, th the name Sihasan uh, is a Dine word that means hope and assurance. And really, it feels very much like the music reflects that sentiment reflects that energy. Uh, Janita, as teenagers, you 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 toured uh, with a band, Blackfire. But I really wonder whose idea was it to form a punk rock uh, group in the early 1990s? I. <laughs> it's funny because I, as a child, I was like, we have a band, and I I drew a logo. You know, I tried to get my friends to join in. I was drumming on pots and pans, but I the first sketch that I made was because where we come from, the coal and the, the burning of that, you know, I could see the this earth and I just could see it as a child, you know, just so clear as like just the world was on fire and yeah. black fire, you know, the way that we see things in indigenous concepts, you know, from the east, black, you know, south, blue, yellow, white, the north, the sacred colors, but just that that black fire, you know, it's like rage. It was like pure, you know, the the pollution on one hand, but also kind of the, the sacredness of of our culture, you know, and the conflicts that we were up against, you know, the collision of, of these two worlds. So that was kind of the initial thought process. And so it was Clayson, really. <laughs> like, let's start a band. And, you know, we, we've grown up very close. Like we're, we're close in age. Um, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of resources growing up. And so we, you know, we, we made believe all kinds of things, you know, if, if one person did something, if one of us siblings did something, then the rest of us were doing it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so music, I, I, if I may real quick, music for me became this voice that, um, that maybe I didn't have all the words um, to express the emotions that I was feeling. So for me, the bass did that. The punk rock community didn't see, they didn't see our age because we were young. They didn't see our color. Um, they didn't see anything. They didn't, they, they didn't make us different because we were different. They, wow. We're just part of this community of really um, different different people that that existed and celebrated each other. Wondering about lyricism, the lyrics. I read, uh, Janita. I read that Parenthood made you stop and think about messaging in terms of your own music um, and the type of message you wanted to send to kids and your own children, for that matter. Is that true? Absolutely. I think something something changes in you when you become a parent. And my brother is also a parent as well. And, you know, the, the, for me, the switch from Blackfire to Seahawson was that on our reservation and on so many reservations here in the United States, um, there is a, a horrible epidemic of youth suicides. And there was one instance that took place on the Navajo Nation um, where there was a youth packed suicide that the youngest child was nine years old. 
And I realized that as a parent, like how, how could a child not have hope at nine years old? Like it was so shocking to me that I realized um, that I wanted that, that I needed, I needed to change um, the messaging of what I was leaving. I mean, anger is a fantastic tool. We get so much done with anger, you know, yeah. it's a fire, it's a fuel, but what happens, what happens after you've been angry for so long? Yeah. Where yeah. do you turn? Yeah. And so for me, um, switching to Seahawson and bringing that, uh, that message of changing the messaging to be more empowering to uh, to be more positive was really important. To that very point, um, you know, as you mentioned, Native American youth living on reservations can often face these overwhelming array of challenges. And I know you've both done a lot of work in this space in terms of youth empowerment. Um, um, Clayson, I wonder if we could talk, you could tell us a little bit about uh, your work at Luep, a high school on the western edge of the Navajo Reservation. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in the high school youth space? Initially, you know, going into starting music, one of the places that that allowed us into the space when we first started out performing was within the school systems on a reservation and on a peer to peer level, just doing things from suicide prevention, drug prevention. So we, you know, naturally kind of gravitated towards production and trying to bring in artists or other people like Joey Ramone or even Maynard oh. from two years back to yeah. come and give, you know, just some inspiration back into our communities. But growing up with traditional dance, with song, with ceremony, even with horses, with these amazing cultural connections, it's like these are tools and we we have to do everything within our power and ability to reach out to that next generation and give them whatever, you know, whether it's try to uplift and empower them in any possible way. So, you know, teaching dance and traditional dance, hoop dance, or some of our social dances that we can share publicly to give those skill sets to the next generation, or whether it's working with, with horses and wild horses, or I also, Janita's got, so many amazing projects, Indigenous Youth Nation, a radio show. So we're wow. a radio show. Nice. Normalize Indigenous cultures. But using music, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's our, that's the tool that we've been blessed with, our form of communication that, that has empowered us to, to go and do the work that, that we feel passionate about. So now it's like, okay, how do we reach out to the next generations and you know, what are the, the cool things that we have, the resources that we have in within our communities? Because yeah. sometimes, you know, we're, we're remote and you don't have music, yeah. you don't have these, mm -hmm. these things. So how do we bring that to, to our home? I watched a conversation with your father, who is the world champion Navajo hoop dancer and nutritional healer, Jones Benali. The interview included you both, um, but also members of your family, uh, the Jones Benali Family Dancers Troupe. And it was recorded at the Library of Congress back in 2019. It was really very inspiring. It was insightful. And it left me feeling like there's so much that we don't know about um, the First Nations people in this country. What has been, you think, your father's legacy to preserving language and culture in the United States? I would just say his existence. Mm. The fact that he is a survivor of the boarding school um, trauma that, that existed, that he still speaks his language, that he, he was the first traditional practitioner, the medicine practitioner to work at a hospital, to work alongside doctors and surgeons, to have his own secretary, to have referrals wow. from allopathic medicine for him to be, for, for him to see patients. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm so proud of our father in yeah. all of, all of the work that he has done for cultural continuation mm. and 
you know, and I think that's so evident with with our next generation, with his grandchildren and and so many of the other children that he has also taught at schools. Yeah. And I'd like to add too that for a lot of our elders, you know, these are our libraries, these are our wisdom mm -hmm. keepers. So yeah. there's such a high honor and respect and, it, you know, something to remind all the viewers out there, you know, it's like there's a circle, you know, this, the way that we view it, you know, as indigenous cultures is, you know, that all, you know, of that knowledge and information that you obtain, you know, as you become an elder, you know, you have to transmit that, that to your grandchildren. You have to connect, you know, and, and share your stories, share your history. Where did your family come from? What is the, what are the challenges? Most of the people on this, in this nation in America are refugees. And now there's such a critical crisis. People are coming in, you know, to, to seek shelter and refuge here in this nation. But if we don't remember our own story and how we got here and have that compassion for others, you know, how are we going to, to welcome people with open arms? You know, it's, so we got to remember, you know, there's, there's powerful teachings within that. Can we talk a little bit about your current project, Sihasen? It feels politically charged with deep roots, yes, in punk rock, but I wonder about uh, the, the, the emphasis on, the extent to which you were focused on activism um, and connecting that with bonds of family and community. Um, Janita, I'll throw that to you. You know, it's interesting uh, to think about even activism because it's not, I don't feel like I'm, I'm an activist. Um, I'm a person who cares immensely about community, about relationships, about building, um, about having communities and building communities that are more than tolerant, that are respectful, mm. that are understanding, that are compassionate. And so sometimes people throw that word at me as, as being an activist, but I really... I'm somebody who just loves our mother earth immensely. I love our, um, I, I love our communities immensely. And yeah. I feel like the songs that I write, the songs that we write, even though some people may say they're social political, I actually, to me, they're love songs. Mm -hmm. I write love songs about equality, about truth, about justice, and about creating a world that 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 is built upon respect. We've seen a lot of data about uh, the the, the COVID nineteen. Um, this has really been heightened in 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 many communities across this country. But I wanted to know, um, you know, what your thoughts are on what we could do now. How do we retrieve that knowledge from that generation that has been in many ways exposed to this virus? And then I also wonder on another level if this is it's it's almost. A repetition of history, right? The idea that a virus is going to come in <laughs> and wipe us out, um, unbeknownst to us, that this thing, it, it doesn't feel a little bit repetitive to you? I've got a beautiful story. You know, my sister and I, we would not be here without the teachings from our grandmother, Zani Benali, back in the 1800s when the, the 1918 flu pandemic came through she's a medicine practitioner and she was with her uncle out with the, the sheep and there's something that had occurred and she checked the there was a saddle that had burned and there were certain things that were kind of like an omen a sign and she saw okay there's a sickness we need to prepare you know this is what's going to happen and there's all the, you know she kind of went through this is what's going to help and how to protect, you know, all this information came to her. So she went and warned and told all the neighbors, her family to prepare for this. And then of course, you know, she was safe. But part of that was, part of that was actually, you know, social distancing, you know, going away with the animals and staying away from people, eating healthy foods, protecting the immune system, the pine needles, all different things that, that our ancestors that my grandmother utilized. And when the CDC, you know, and all, all the warnings started to come out of, okay, we've got this pandemic coming almost 100 years to, you know, to that exact date, it was like, okay, our grandmother prepared us for this. And, 
you know, the CDC is giving the exact same advice that our grandmother is, but we did, we did lose a lot of elders, you know, with COVID-19 taking precautions. I think that our tribe took more precautions than, than the United States and their kind of, uh, measures that they rolled out initially and that kind of hopefully helped pave the way you know with with our tribe you know there was more stringent kind of lockdowns and ensuring that that people were having hopefully you know ppe there was a lot of organizations there was a curfew as well people helping because of those um challenges that we have where we don't have running water where we don't have electricity we have very few hospitals, very few supermarkets. And with curfew, it's like the challenges that we had in combating that was very different than what a lot of the majority of America had. I'm thinking about how artificial intelligence is changing our lived experiences in our schools for sure. But as we sit here, I'm also thinking about the art and culture. And what are your concerns about artificial intelligence and music and preserving culture over time? You know, I I think it, it's interesting. I don't know a lot about artificial intelligence because I spend a lot of time with traditional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but um, there's you. Know, we have so much to learn. We have so much to learn. Our ancestors have already learned so much, and those teachings are there. And you know, as as we look to the world, as as we look to the future, we're always looking so far away from our ancestors, so far away from a traditional, respectful way of life. We're from the earth, even. Yeah, yeah being from the earth. So, um, you know, it's it's so important for us to connect with each other. And and you know, yeah, I wish I I knew more about artificial intelligence except I do know that like you can make up stories and then artificial intelligence will like make that the truth. I'm like, "Ooh, could we make like <laughs> how can how can we as indigenous people then, you know, help to influence artificial intelligence? How can we yeah. as land-based people um, you know, make those influences, but it's, it's, um, there is a danger to every technology yeah. is we know as Dine, we, this isn't our first world. Um, there mm -hmm. have been other worlds that have been ruined before, um, yeah. by, you know, by, by so many lessons. And so we know that we have to be careful. Yeah. We know that, you know, we, we have to be respectful. We, we oftentimes take for granted um, the goodness that's around us. Yeah. We try to create something else when there is already so much goodness. Right here. Clayson, what do people get right or wrong about music, linking music and advocacy um, and activism? I'll just throw that word back in there. <laughs> well, Growing up, our, our mother, she's from the village scene in New York and later transplanted to California. But that folk scene, you know, that's a, a big part of our influences. A lot of artists that were friends of hers, you know, when she'd bring them to Grand Canyon, to northern Arizona, to the Navajo Nation, you know, they kind of planted that seed of, you know, it's not about trying to copy or emulate anybody else. When you write a song, you know, you're using your own voice, mm. but you're, you know, you're telling a story. And a lot of times using your platform, using that as an opportunity to talk and address social injustices or different issues. My mom, she worked at a, a venue in, in California that worked with Cesar Chavez, with the Black oh, the Panther, Ash Grove. Ash Grove, with what was happening in Wounded Knee, Pine Ridge and wow. later and that's how she kind of met my father and ended up kind of moving from Hollywood out to, to the Navajo reservation during wow. the big mountain black Mesa. So there's so much history in, in music and being a mouthpiece of a voice, helping to even going to standing rock, you know, with the Dakota access pipeline yeah. musicians still, you know, talking about and hopefully spreading the message about, 
okay, these are the inequities, these are the injustices, or maybe doing benefit concerts or fundraising and helping causes and supporting, you know, so many, I think every aspect of our world has been under threat since the last previous administration. We have so much work to do so that you know, it's like we're, we're still putting out those fires, still trying to build, rebuild those bridges and yeah. music is definitely a conduit to reconnect all those. I'd like to add to really quick that, so we grew up also with our father who is a traditional medicine man and Hatatli in our language is a medicine person, medicine man, medicine woman, but it also means a singer. And when you have a ceremony done, you have a singing done over you. You have your community, um, the, the apprentices, the practitioner come and sing for your well-being. And so we also have that strong foundation of understanding that, um, that music isn't just music, that music is in fact healing. We're having this conversation in the middle of your nationwide tour where you are, where are you headed? Um, and what can audiences expect if they're so lucky enough to get a ticket to one of your concerts this summer? We just finished the Grassroots Festival in Trumansburg, which is one of the greenest uh, festivals in America. And we are headed to the Kennedy Center um, in a few days. In Washington, D.C., yeah. And so... Um, you know, what can people expect when they come to our shows? They can expect uh, honesty, <laughs> authentic, authentic, authentic intelligence and traditional and, you know, and, and tradi traditional singing with, you know, with the backbone of punk music, but with folk and world and pop. And you can you can expect that you shouldn't expect uh, anything that's within a box or with a label. Expect that we are unexpected and we're just truly who we are. I love it. I love it. It was been such a pleasure seeing you both, meeting you, speaking with you. Janita and Clayson Benali are multi-award winning musicians, a duo, duo excuse me, from the band Shihasen. We are signing off with their new single, We the People. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you so much. And, you know, please follow us on our social media. I also want to make a plug for my doggy, Mr. Happy Face. He is uh, last year's world's ugliest dog winner. But he <laughs> utilizes his platform to remind people to adopt senior dogs and to adopt the underdog. And that's it for our program today. You, remember, you can follow me and the show on Instagram or Twitter. Thank you so much for watching Feminism Today on Free Speech TV. Join us again next week. Yeah. 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 Yeah.